been away for a little bit. Partially, I was a little busy with things happening in real life. Also, I've had a really bad cough, infection, whatever, for the last few weeks. So I've been like waylaid, and I'm still not completely over it. Because you probably get coughing as I talk. It's just like I'm doing my best, but I'm still at the back end of this, whatever this is. So um, I I'm still coughing quite a bit. So um, hopefully I won't come out when I'm doing this. But uh, I'm just every swap I get some coughs. So just a warning in advance. So this first week back will be fairly simple stuff. It's not going to be too complicated. I'm not uh, going to go crazy with complicated films. <coughs> so I'm starting off with some film documentaries, which is going to be, um, I've got two of them on desk, the rest I saw online. Uh, she, Werner Herzog, Radical Dreamer. You have a Scala, you have a Phil Tippett, uh, Mad Gods documentary. Um, what's the f f f title? Mad Dreams and Monsters and Movie Pass and Movie Crash, um, which is a bit Movie Pass phenomena in America. So, four different types of films I'm going to cover. <coughs> and this is mainly to say go watch these films, really. Some are better than others, but they're all worth a look for different reasons. None of them, I would say, are amazing. None of them are like top level documentaries. But they, they all have subject matters which are worthwhile watching. So that's that's why you should watch them. So they start off with Fun of Herzog, Radical Dreamer. And this you also get some extras, love, like uh, some, some um, outtakes of bits they took out the documentary that are still quite interesting about Herzog from different people talking about him. But I mean basically it's the story of Werner Herzog over the 40 plus years he's been a director from his early start in Germany, his problems in Germany with um, not being appreciated. I mean, you, I mean you get a few directors like Schlondorf and um, Wim Wenders talking about him this mad crazy bastard that sh who was part of their generation um, and then you go into the second half of the documentaries about his second half of his career when he started doing documentaries and then did fiction films again and so the first half is basically setting him up as a director and also the, the Klaus Kinski years and then the second half is how he evolved over time but this is only 90 minutes long and that's kind of the big problem with the documentary, I find, is, like, Herzog's career is... You can only really um, do a surface-level thing of Herzog in, tw in 90 minutes. His career's very uh, in-depth in lots of ways. I mean, you do a full documentary on his childhood. This does a lot of bit, you're, you're wanting more of his childhood because it's really interesting about how he was... He came out during the war. He was um, he was taken outside the, the areas where they were getting bombed, and um, he lived in the countryside, and then went back to the, the cities later on, where he started to become a filmmaker. All that stuff's fascinating, but you you don't really get enough of that. Then you get into his uh, career as a director uh, during the German years, but you only really get certain highlights. I mean, you get like uh, Aguirre, Wrath of God. You get Fitzcarraldo, and you get a few references to other films, but it's it's almost like these are the two great ones, and it's like actually they're not. <laughs> these are the two famous ones. A lot of the stuff that uh, from the Herzog made in the seventies that weren't those two were actually just as strong, if not stronger, than those two films. I mean, Heart of Glass is amazing. Uh, Strushek is amazing. There's there's so many good films he's made there. Uh, Fatima Morgana. Just, it was in films, just non stop great films during that period. And quite a lot of them barely get mentioned. You make an image or two from them, but you don't really get that much on them. And it's like, this is a full documentary in itself. The subject matter of the 70s. Well, what he did in the 70s is quite astonishing. And it's like, you don't really get that much of that. Then you get, like, um, he was doing documentaries until Grizzly Man and Grizzly Man made him big again. He started doing feature films and documentaries and books and things. 
But again, you don't get into the detail of it. You don't get into the detail of um, he, he, Chris the Man gets a uh, because it's a famous one. It gets um a bit more attention. Again, that's a documentary that looks at his greatest hits, and then looks at a bit more what he's like personally. But it tends to um cut back too quickly, so you end up not getting some of the really great films he was doing. Like, um, it'll cover some of the Queen of the Desert because it's filmed big stars in it. It'll vaguely cover Rescue Dawn, which is a good film. But it's there's other ones he didn't cover at all in this film. Um, and it's this thing where it's like, you're only covering the big hits. And uh, the thing about Werner Herzog is a lot of the joy in his films comes to films that maybe are underappreciated. There's, there's, he's, made a, he's made most of his films are basically films that accumulate over time and become more powerful over time because they are the way they were made and not all of them are easy to digest and this film documentary kind of ignores that it kind of is like it's like um, it forgets what makes his all great because it's trying to just be comprehensive of the things you might have heard of and it kind of misses the um, the mark for why Herzog's such an important director, and why some of his failures lead to some of his successes, and all that stuff is not really covered. And it's like that's a disappointing part of this documentary. It's like it's like it's good, but it's not great. It's there's, the bits it covers is quite interesting, but there's there's so many films that they could have covered that were much more interesting. I mean, you get very little time in Lessons of Darkness, which is all about Iraq War, where Werner Herzog was uh, hated for. You get a little bit about that, but not much. You, a lot of his later documentaries, you get a nod. You know, if there's an odd one here or there, like, um, <coughs> like the, the, the one he did about um, just Antarctica, that's mentioned. But you don't get other ones that are just as good. The World Blue Yonder, which with Brad Dourif, you don't get that. You don't get um, the um, Caves of Forgotten Dreams, which is in 3D and there was a bit of uh, area that's shut off the world because it's such an old, it's, 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 the, it's the kind of oldest link to civilization from the past, like uh, cave drawings from the furthest back in time in France, things like that. It's like you don't get that stuff and it's like, that's Herzog, that's what you need in a Herzog documentary and you don't get that and it's like, it's very frustrating. So that's that first documentary. It's good, just not great. It was like, it should have been like a three-parter or something. It should have really have been like full on. Instead it was kind of half assed <coughs> <coughs> Next we have Scala. Which is at the Scala Cinema in um, London. Now, but this could be be any cinema around the world because there, there are so many t cities that have cinemas like Scala, where there's like the art house cinema where they show the good stuff, the trashy stuff. I mean, in Edinburgh, there's the Cameo, which I used to go to when I lived in Edinburgh. There's the cinemas all over the world like this. This is the because it's the London one. They're talking about the Scala because it was lasted for a very long time, and a lot of them, a lot of people who went into the media went there. But it doesn't really matter if you went there or not when you watch the film. If you know these kind of like film clubs and things, you know <coughs> exactly what it's about. Like watching weird films that you've never heard of, giving things a shot. I mean, it reminded me a lot when I went was a film student. I went to um, Sheffield and went to Sheffield University's Film Society while I was at Sheffield Hallam University, and you just wander over there and watch tons of films over there as well. And it can remind me of that that as well. It's, if film societies are film societies, even if they're more commercial based, like Scala or Cameo, it's still the idea is there's going to be like um, overnight things where you crawl out at six in the morning when you're like half dead after watching like four films all through the night stuff like that watching weird films that you've never heard of giving stuff a shot mixing the kind of more commercial obvious stuff with the really weird stuff when you're thinking what the hell am i watching 
it's that kind of thing that obviously obviously influenced this channel quite a bit but it's just the general idea is a wide range of films covered in one venue which is this film and uh, you get lots of nice extras like uh, extra hours worth of, of documentaries some short films are showed at the Scala and you hear a lot of interviews with different people talking about the different times of Scala from when it started with Steve Woolley who would go on to uh, produce Mona Lisa and things like that and create Palace <coughs> to the later curators and the idea was that somebody can continue on and a lot of people went and it was like <coughs> it was important to the kind of London area because it was, for, it was a home for all the kind of weirdos in London. For all the people wanting to see the kind of strange films, that was the place to be. And it's a good documentary about the rise and fall and what it meant to people. But again, there's, there's, there's a place like that all over the world. It's just it's a phenomenon that, that just keeps on going because people want to get together and watch films. I like watching films on my own, but there's also a joy of watching films with other people too. It's like um, a communal service. For certain films, it really works. Other films doesn't matter so much. And then there's no talk about films would be packed out and other times you'd be with three people in the cinema. I've been to places like that. <laughs> it's like, that's normal if you if you go, if you follow your nose for films. Uh, some films you think it's gonna, people are going to go see and no one cares about and other times. Other films think, like, why is this too packed? It's just, that's just life. So I recommend it as, like Werner Herzog documentary, it feels like it's a bit short, it could have been longer, it could have been more details, but it's still enjoyable. Now we go to uh, Mad Dream, the Phil Tippett documentary. It's, it's really good. It's probably the best of them. It's the shortest, I think. It's only about an hour 20. But it just covers his career from just being a typical weirdo, interest in stop motion to uh, become a titan of the industry special effects wise well maintaining doing what he likes doing so Tippett was the stop motion guy after Ray Harryhausen after Ray Harryhausen was retiring Tippett was the next guy on the on the rung of the greats who knew how to do this thing who understood the, the craftsmanship and he would um, he did all the stop motion in Star Wars the original trilogy he also was one of the people doing designing some of the uh, creatures for Star Wars, and he was a guy in charge of the Return of the Jedi creature shop. He was he was in charge at that point, and he was the guy designing a lot of stuff for the Jabba's palace. Um, so he, he was never really interested in robots; he was more interested in creatures. So the thing about Star Wars was the easy way it, it break it down was. Phil Tippett had a lot to do with the, he was much more of this, the creatures and Joe Johnson who would also go to be a director, he was, in, he was much more of the technology side. So you, plus there's a bunch of other people in doing other stuff as well, but those two were kind of dominant in the special effects organisation. So he did all that, then he kind of, had, after the Return of the Jedi and they'd done Dragon Wick, which was the massive dragon film where they managed to create go motion which is a new technique based from stop motion that advanced the field quite a bit and he'd done Raiders of the Lost Ark too and after Return of the Jedi he was kind of burnt out a little bit so he started to do some short films on his own again and then slowly built up a company with his wife who is the kind of organiser of the family like he was a dreamer she was organiser even though she liked all the art stuff as well but she was the one who could organise it so the documentary makes it clear that if she was in charge, he'd have gone bankrupt years ago. Because <laughs> she's the one that can organise all this stuff. Which is a nice part of the documentary. It's like, it's not just, oh, this guy's a genius. It's like, uh, this is what he did. These are the people who helped him. These are the important people in his life. So it goes on to show him doing Robocop, where he creates the um, Ed 209. And he works, figures out how to work at a low budget. And he sort of starts to come back in through a kind of these films with Verhoeven. And he, he did Robocop 2 and he did the big... The best parts of Robocop 2 are Phil Tippett's stop motion stuff. Really. If, even everyone involved in the film says that as well. It was, like, that was the big thing. Uh, he's the one who created Robo the Robocop 2 creature and he's the one who um, figured out... He, did all, he basically shot the ending. 
Um, because Evan Custer, who's done the Empire Strikes Back with him, trusts him that much. He basically was like, okay, these are the plans. They worked out how we do it. And he said, okay, you do it, and I'll deal with the actors and these other scenes. And that's how they did the ending of Robocop 2. Um, then he went on to Jurassic Park, where we were shooting Robocop 2. Um, he got the book, and Spielberg wanted them on involved. Then that's when they moved over from stop motion to digital, which happened during Jurassic Park. They, they realised they could do the, the creatures using uh, CGI rather than stop motion. But because he was such a good... Um, the thing is, CGI is actually st the next stage of stop motion, really. CGI is basically taking the techniques of stop motion frame by frame and creating it in a computer rather than doing physical models. So... Um, one of the reasons why the, the, a lot of the effects in the 90s work better than the effects you now is because they're made by people who understood they came from stop motion, who understood movement and understood the weight of movement. So it could create a sense of reality that you, you lost as you went on, as people could do just do anything. And so he was a guy who was pioneering how to make sure these creatures had weight, how to make sure that uh, everything you saw had weight to it, and it, was, it wasn't just... Like empty spectacle and so he was like the kind of creature kind of supervisor they sort of does they sort of supervise on that and he was very, very influential in making sure that the dinosaurs worked like they kind of take the basically figured out the tech guys can do a lot but they can't actually do the movement and Tippett has people who do the movement and could supervise the movement within of the creatures <coughs> from Jurassic Park he moved on to um Starship Troopers, which was it's still one of the big like CGI films. If you want to see how well CGI can do in a film, because this was a film with thousands of creatures and certain shots, it was basically it was such a big budget, spectacular for for that they essentially when it came to the actual action, they needed like three directors. They basically had Verhoeven doing the first unit, Vic Hampson doing the second unit, and Phil Tippett in between the units and be in charge of all the creatures <coughs> because there was so much to do it was so ambitious and the whole idea was this was a step forward from Jurassic Park but we're still using the techniques of like they're multiplying all these creatures but you're still using uh, stop motion techniques to create the movement which was the movement thing that created the sense of danger for the creatures from then on the film goes into the idea that Basically, he's a supervisor now in his company who work in lots of films and make sure the special effects are good and the effects work. But he was less involved and he made his own film called Mad God, which is uh, I've, it's something I've covered already in this channel. It's really good. It's a terrific film. <coughs> All stop motion. He's doing a different uh, stop motion film. So he's basically his company runs to the side of him now and he does what he's doing. <coughs> and he's basically one of those people who from the 80s survived and thrived where a lot of people who were the geniuses of the 80s like Rick Baker and Rob Bertin have retired a lot are long gone and Tippett still managed to produce stuff he's a good years and bad years but he knows what he's doing and he's got a, lot, a good team of people around him who know what they're doing and the film is about the idea of how you evolve in an industry Especially how do you survive an industry when your interests are not really about the uh, big awards and things, but you're interested in certain things within that craftsmanship <coughs> and how that evolves. So it's definitely of the films I've covered, that's definitely the one to see because it's more about one person and about their life. And the life suggests being one 90 minute um, film. It's not like it's everything about Phil Tippett, it's just like these are the important things about me need to know and they cover everything important. <coughs> but also it's like he's still got a career. Finally we have Movie Pass, Movie Crash, which is the weakest documentary in this set. The only reason I bring it up is like, um, it's an interesting subject matter. The film itself is a bit smug. It meanders, it's only 90 minutes, but it does meander a little bit at times. 
it takes a while to get going and the big problem is, is we know it's a thing about a crash it's in the title movie pass movie crash but it's also it's so obvious this thing would never work that actually the way they structure it <coughs> doesn't quite work because they start off with them um, as it's starting to rise and you know it's going to crash and it's starting to rapidly rise and then suddenly you cut back to this beginning of movie pass years before what it originally was meant to be and then they, they bring it back to the the time as it goes what the story goes on and then you move forward well the problem is that's just to get people who are interested in the, in the crash which we all know is going to happen but the human side of the story is missing the first third of the film which you're getting all this stuff about the industry which is like we're better off starting the film doesn't seem how they started and how they built or doing a better structure for this film the structure's just all over the place it's also the problem with the film is it's like it's hung up in the idea of two things. One, it was a it was an idea started by two black guys who were people in the industry who were investors, and it's really uh, pushing that home so much that it's like we, we get it, we're sympathetic, but you can't mention it again, and again. We get the idea. You don't have to tell us every bloody two minutes. And when you start telling us that again and again, you could have been into going into more about their lives and who they were and what they were rather than just making them symbols. And that becomes a problem. It's like, I'm interested in these guys, tell me more about them. No, we're just gonna stick to this one thing. It's like, it's it's a awful white man bringing down the black guys. And it's like, yeah, we know that. You've got me, you just need to expand now and not stick to the basic situation you can actually like tell me more about these people and they never really do that and then they go to the uh, the two white guys who are who ruin the company it's it's not that interesting it's like you know these guys are have terrible ideas um and the uh, kind of progression from them and brought in and why they were brought in to them ruin everything get rid of the original founders it's done too quick and it's done in a way that it's like i need a bit more and also there's lots of stuff about the people who worked here when it was a startup and then when the um these guys come in and what happened there and how they were basically not treated well that needed more everything that was interesting was there it's like you just need more of this and less of the stuff telling us the obvious thing we know just eliminating the things that you've already set up that's potentially interesting and instead it never really does that it just becomes this thing of well this was an idea this is what we want to do and this is how it's ruined and it's, it keeps the simplistics when if you're really looking for more nuance and it's also um, they don't go into much detail it's like this thing was obviously going to crash because they took the idea, they changed it completely and they made that obviously something that was not going to last. What's going on here? And well, these are the issues with this idea. And they also don't go into the idea that people were scamming this thing. The consumers who signed up for it knew it was a con. They just knew it was a coin, it was obviously a coin, and um, they just, they just abused the system and they said, oh, they changed the rules, and it's like, you're getting free movies for like, eight months, of course it was a coin, why are you complaining? <coughs> <coughs> the people who get coin makes it with the people invested in it, that was where the coin was coming from. And, and now there's a new movie pass that's much more stringent and, and people are complaining like oh it's not as good as the old one you're like the old one was a con it's, and, and, and the film never goes into detail of a lot of these people who were fans of movie pass just abused rigged the system so badly as well as the people running it and who ruined the idea it's like everybody took what could have been a simple, a simple idea you pay a subscription thing and you get just certain amount of movies per month 
just using this card and that's it it should have been simple it's like it's a way of avoiding just paying it in advance and then knowing you just you're going to use it and it's going to be affordable movie ticket prices instead it abused by the consumer and by the people who are basically using it for other means and they, they definitely attacked the people who abused it on the corporate end I wish they'd done more detail about that as well but they never I'm not sure if it do with lawsuits or not but another end that they're, they're a bit scared about attacking the consumer for abusing this so much and it's like you know you should have a real documentary would have said hey what this is in you you knew this is a con and the film doesn't do that and it's like I mean, the thing is people need income from these ticket sales like if you're an independent filmmaker or something that's how you make your money to make the next film <coughs> <coughs> if you're making sure they don't, they don't get that money you're conning them and that's that's the thing the film never goes into detail about just the idea that um, these people were conning but were also like, taking advantage of a system that was just not legit and it was it was an unsustainable model now to be honest I don't care about the movie studios as much because they're obviously big corporate things I'm much more uh, concerned about independent film makers who are getting conned this way that's what I'm more interested in rather than anything else the whole idea of movie pass was to make it easier to make it affordable to see movies to actually go and increase people people found it very difficult to go and see movies and uh, because it was so expensive and things it was just trying to find a way to make it reasonable and make it easy for them just to use the movie pass to go and see movies that actually enjoy themselves and increase the cinema from going that was the idea and it didn't just get completely abused so it's definitely worth a, a watch but it is a very flawed film because it doesn't go into all the interesting stuff like the, the guys who founded it you don't even you don't fully get what they were about and your feeling is there was some stuff in the current room floor but it explained it a little bit more you get an idea of them but you're not fully there's certain bits you think I'd like to know more there more there more there as part of the story and you don't get it and you're feeling there's, there's, there's a better documentary here that it wasn't quite done as well so it's enjoyable but it's not great it could have been better so I hope you enjoyed this and um, that's the documentaries <laughs>